a very good uh, a very good evening to all the participants and welcome to today's exclusive webinar on gas hydrogen blending i am sujay sarkar working as senior assistant director gas federation of indian petroleum industry uh, before we get started a few housekeeping things to note by default participants microphone and camera are turned off if you have any questions during the presentation feel free to post in the q and a tab and given the time limit we will try to accommodate as many questions as possible so without further ado let me invite mr gurmit singh director general fipi to welcome the participants and deliver the opening remarks over to you sir well, very good evening it is my honor and uh, privilege in welcoming all of you to this exclusive webinar on gas hydrogen blending as we are all aware that world is undergoing an energy tra uh, transformation from high carbon to low carbon or zero carbon energy sources in order to reduce the global greenhouse gas emission and to avoid the severe impact of climate change blending hydrogen into the existing gas grid could be an important stepping stone during the transition to a sustainable net zero future as the name suggests it integrates concentration of hydrogen into the existing natural gas pipeline in order to reduce carbon intensity of the methane the blending carries the mix of hydrogen and natural gas to the desired location some of the benefits of gas hydrogen blending could be it allows use of existing network of natural gas transmission and distribution pipeline emission reduction reduction of upfront capital cost demand creation of hydrogen there are several developments including project announcements initiation of pilot projects funding of research that is taking place around the world to carry out the blending of green hydrogen in the natural gas pipeline some of which are known to us i would like to share with you the first is a high plant project in the us led by the us department of energy aims to increase potential of gas hydrogen blending this project is composed of six national laboratories and over 20 participants from the various universities and industry i am happy to share that we have one of the eminent speaker who will give the detailed presentation about this high plant project second project is a high deploy project is a uk first practical project to demonstrate the hydrogen can be safely blended into natural gas distribution system without making any changes to appliances we are fortunate that the project in charge of high deploy project is with us today and uh, you will hear him shortly and the third project which is known to us this emiland project of netherland finds that blending of hydrogen up to 30% did not pose any difficulties for household uh, devices like cooking appliances another uh, hype essay hydrogen park south australia project is the first project to blend hydrogen with natural gas for supply using the gas networks india has also taken many initiatives in this regard first to promote hydrogen for mobility sector 18% blend of hydrogen with cng scng which we call here in india as an automotive fuel which is notified scng plant and the dispensing station started by indian oil igl and with the delhi transport department dtc and 50 buses in delhi are flying flying on hsc scng on on a pilot basis based on the outcome of the results the same shall be scaled up across the country in major cities secondly gale has started first kick off first of its kind project of gas hydrogen blending as a pilot project to establish techno commercial feasibility in its city gas distribution networks this speaker from uh, gale will also share his experience on the same recently there was a news that ntpc the country's premier energy utility company has taken up the initiative of blending green hydrogen in the gas network of gujarat gas going forward the success of various ongoing projects across world of gas hydrogen blending can prove an important step towards 
developing hydrogen economy. However, there are few questions which which we should, I, I I hope we, we, we will be covered during the various presentation. Several projects worldwide are demonstrating blends of hydrogen concentration as high as 30 percent. But long term impact of hydrogen on the material equipment is not well understood, which make it challenging for the industry to plan around the blending at a large scale. Another question, what kind of standard and regulatory framework are required for blending? And third, what kind of safety codes are required to cover blending aspects and so on? We have very distinguished panelists today, and I am sure that these questions would be answered, uh, will be answered through their presentations. And I personally thank them for agreeing to share their experience with us today. This kind of knowledge sharing sessions and collaborative approach is very much required as concept of blending is currently is in a very, very early stage of development. And in this regard, PP on the behalf of industry would be happy to collaborate with NREL or progressive energy going forward. With these words, I once again welcome you all and I look forward to the program and hope that you all will find the webinar engaging, fruitful, and beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for setting the tone for today's webinar. As rightly said, gas hydrogen blending is considered one of the pathways to decarbonize, uh, to meet the decarbonization goals. Blending is becoming a national hydrogen strategy for many countries. Hence, today we are witnessing many such pilot projects exploring the impacts of hydrogen blending around the world. To get an overview of such blending projects, we are delighted to have three eminent speakers with us today. Let me first call upon Mr. Charles Perez Store to give an overview of the high deploy blending program. Charles is uh, currently associated with Progressive Energy as project lead for the high deploy project. Charles is a chartered chemical engineer and also holds a master degree from the University of Cambridge. So over to you, Charles. Thank you, CJ. Um, let me just share my presentation. Uh, okay. Can you all see that? Okay. CJ, is that coming through on the screen? Okay. Yeah, fine. Okay. Can you Perfect. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll crack on crack on then. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, CJ and Mr. Singh for um, that introduction. Um, so it's a great privilege um, to be here speaking to you today um, about the high deploy project and hydrogen blending. The petroleum industry have a huge role to play in the energy transition with a wealth of engineering skills and capabilities, particularly in hydrogen, uh, due to the nature of downstream refinery processes. Um, and hydrogen blending is really the first step on the journey to decarbonization of the gas networks. So the content that I'm gonna share with you today um, I'm going to briefly touch on the context and regulatory landscape in the UK as we've, we've introduced the, the general concepts already, um, outline some of the operational trials that we've been conducting in the UK uh, as part of high deploy, um, and then the next steps and path forwards to a full rollout, which is ultimately uh, the objective moving from trials to rollout. So uh, there we go. Um, so first of all, what is high deploy? So High Deploy is a, uh, an off-gem funded project. So that's a, the UK energy regulators. So it's taxpayer funded innovation project um, in, uh, across the gas networks. Uh, we are formed a consortium uh, formed of project partners. So Cadent and Northern Gas Networks are two of the four gas networks in the UK. Progressive Energy ourselves are the project managers on, on the project um, and also joined by the Health and Safety Executive Sciences Division to provide a lot of the uh, technical uh, input into the project, uh, Keele University, where we conducted the first uh, operational trial, um, and ITM Power, who supplied the electrolyzer for that first trial. So the project objective, as it says there on the screen, is really to unlock the safety case for hydrogen blending. And that's our focus, the safety and the technical uh, side of things. The, some of the commercial and billing aspects we've touched on in the, as part of the project, but they're ultimately outside of the scope. I should say here as well, the project is UK focused. So whilst the knowledge and lessons will be applicable elsewhere, some of the details may be different. So I will focus on, on the UK content uh, as that's my experience. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing the other speakers about the, the international projects, but hopefully some of the lessons will be uh, applicable uh, across um, countries. 
Um, so why hydrogen blending? So gas uh, dominates UK energy consumption through both heating for industrial processes and domestic heating, uh, and also largely through electricity generation there, as you can see on the pie chart, about 40% of that, that electricity generation, give or take because of the amount of renewables, uh, is provided by, by gas today. Um, so blending could have a huge impact across the UK. Uh, we could save about 6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year, and it's the equivalent to taking about 2.5 million cars off the road. So it's a significant step, but obviously it's not the full goal to, to 2050. So why is it a key step? It ultimately means we can start the journey to decarbonizing the gas networks, but whilst retaining the security of supply uh, of the existing natural gas system um, without the disruption to consumers. And that's a key point that, that I'll come on to, um, and it, it mentions there on the slide. So why do we need hydrogen or even gas? Ultimately, there are three key uh, aspects of that energy vector. Uh, the high energy density, the ease and the low cost of transportation and storage of that energy, and the fact that it can produce high temperature heat for industrial uh, processes and other applications. So that's some of the context on, on why, why we need to do this. The regulatory context. So in the UK, the gas safety management regulations govern the quality of the gas in the networks. Uh, and in the legislation, it currently limits hydrogen to 0.1 uh, mole percent. Through Hydroploy, we are focused on lifting that to 20% and providing the evidence crate creation to get approval from the health and safety executive to enable that regulatory change process to occur. Critically, though, we would stay within existing WOBI limits for uh, domestic uh, and appliances uh, and, and other aspects connected to the network. So the UK government policy plans, hydrogen blending is a key step on the journey to net zero, as uh, the Prime Minister outlined in the 10 point plan. And again, last year in the hydrogen strategy, there was a target of five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen by 2030, which just to yesterday has been moved to 10 gigawatts. So plans are accelerating, but ultimately that the build out of that market requires the first stepping stone. So why 20%? So uh, in the introduction, I think 30% was mentioned and in the UK, we're focused on 20%. And the reason for that is that in order for blending to be successful, it needs to uh, have a non-disruptive change for consumers. Uh, domestic appliances are the most numerous connected to the gas network. Um, and if any modifications were required, it would present a major barrier to roll out. Um, the appliances uh, for on sale for the last 30 years have been governed by a standard, BSEN 437, which it shows there on the screen, the two different tables where that applies. And the test gas for that, for the light back condition, which is a, uh, a scenario where the, the flame would remove all the way back to the burner and into the pipework, which could cause a safety consequence, uh, flame out and explosion. Um, that test gas uses 23% hydrogen with methane. So it's therefore the hypothesis that if it's already tested and safe on 23%, well, when we do it in normal operation up to 20% within the existing Wobby limits, it should also be the same. So the, the objective has been to find the evidence and prove that that's the case. But the lesson for other countries will be that you need to consider historical standards, what equipment was manufactured to, what those limits and tests were, and therefore what the standard uh, could be applied. So onto the project stages. So I'll whistle through this quite quickly. So we had three stages, a uh, private network trial at Keele University. They'll come on to again uh, in a minute. Uh, a public network trial, so expanding the scope to more homes and uh, a more complex situation with less control over the, um, uh, the network necessarily. Um, and then onto the final stage, which is developing the wider evidence base for full rollout of blending. Uh, and you can see the timings on the screen here in terms of uh, starting in 2017, then completing the Kiel trial in 2019. In parallel with that, we developed the second stage for the evidence for the public network trial at Wynn Leighton, uh, which is a village in the northeast of England. That trial is currently operational. So today people cook their breakfast and had their showers based on hydrogen blended gas. Real success story. And finally, we're now in the full safety evidence based creation uh, which is currently in, de in development, and I'll come on to at the end some of the challenges uh, around that. That incorporates industrial, commercial, higher pressure tiers, etc. Okay, so the Keele University trial. So for this international audience, Keele University is a campus university in the Mid West Midlands with its own private gas network. So it controls the gas network there, and they're partners on the program. So it was a logical first place to host the trial. 
That process began with a, an extensive evidence creation process to secure the first ever exemption for hydrogen blending in the UK from the health and safety executive. So the evidence uh, touched on the fundamental gas characteristics, i.e. things like, does hydrogen separate from methane? Uh, the answer is no, not in real conditions. How are the materials suitable in terms of uh, the polyethylene pipework or the steels involved uh, in, in, in and copper, et cetera, in, in all the distribution pipework from the pressure tiers through to the appliance and also critically the appliance safety. So testing that hypothesis, did 20% did uh, work okay, given that it was the standard gas? So we did laboratory testing of the specific types of appliances that were present on the network that we did a survey on uh, and we showed that they would be suitable gained that safety exemption and approval from the health and safety executive. The compound, as you can see here, um, involved uh, an electrolyzer uh, producing hydrogen into the buffer tank that's labeled. That um, buffer tank then uh, discharged into the grid entry unit, which is on the top of the screen, before going through the volume loop that you can see here, if you can see my mouse through to check the composition was within the legal limit and then discharge into uh, the network for consumers. And if there was a fault and the composition was overblended, there was an interlock cutoff that would, would retain safety for the consumers. Um, there's also a video that outlines some of that a bit more, but for the interest of time, I haven't shared it here, uh, but the link is on there and can be shared with participants after the, the webinar um, to, to review it at your leisure. The key point here was it was a safe and successful first trial of hydrogen blend in the UK between uh, across 100 homes and 30 university buildings. So taking in domestic boilers uh, for hot water, et cetera, all the way up to uh, commercial catering for the university buildings. Abated about 27 tonnes of CO2 and used 42,000 standard cubic metres of hydrogen in the process. So a very small first step, but the evidence that it unlocks was, was the key. It was a hugely valuable platform to understand the real world uh, operations impacts uh, and many lessons to learn for future blending. So we tested things like rhinology, the smell of the gas, was it affected? No, it wasn't, uh, not within perceptible uh, limits for humans or, um, to detect. Um, and the key thing that the video highlights well, but wasn't time to show, the social sciences aspect around this was important. Did consumers accept the blend? Was there pushback? Did they notice? And the answers really were, were no. They just got on with their lives as normal. It happened. They were happy about it. And actually, their fears were reduced about hydrogen because of participating in it and seeing the non-disruptive pathway. So that shows that it's a critical first step for gaining public support to move to a 100% conversion that would involve uh, some disruption. It also facilitated innovation in terms of new blend uh, gas ready detection equipment and sensor systems. So the public network trial. So this uh, was in Winlayton, which is uh, near a little village uh, near uh, Gateshead in the northeast of England. Um, and there's a picture there, you can see the, the areas of the homes in scope. It was an isolated network of about uh, 670 homes, uh, a school, a church and, uh, and a shop. Um, and the hydrogen was injected at the low Thornley compound that you can see there, which was run by Northern Gas Networks. So the, oops, uh, skip something. So the compound is in a second. Um, so the, the safety case uh, was much more extensive for this trial. So we went from a location specific uh, safety case to a more generalized uh, evidence base. So that included a lot more uh, representative and comprehensive set of, of GB appliances. Um, and also greater diversity of assets in terms of the materials was specifically cast iron, the legacy equipment in, in the uh, pipe work in the UK uh, being a particular challenge and one that we produced evidence for. Ultimately, through that process, we were able to demonstrate a generalized case so that the, the safety case was on that, that uh, generalized basis uh, and the QRA, the quantitative risk assessment was reflective of all of GB, but also the Winlayton trial area. Uh, and the cast iron, we got a very long way towards demonstrating it is safe in perpetuity with the 20% blend, with the final evidence uh, to come following the trial in the third stage of the project. Um, there were other mitigations we put in place, but those were for an ALARP demonstration uh, and beyond the credit of what we took in the risk assessment. The hydrogen facilities I mentioned, you can see there, there was a similar blending setup as the university trial uh, with the volume loop and the composition control. 
although in this case we didn't use the electrolyzer as there were technical and timeline challenges to move it uh, from the keel trial uh, to to the northern gas network site and therefore we used tube trailer uh, production from air products with offsetting to to mitigate the carbon emissions ultimately a stable and reliable hydrogen supply operation uh, was achieved and again enabling so far no appliance issues or differences observed by the residents with uh, are operating right up to the 20% um, composition limit within process control uh, variation um, and commenced in, in August last year due to end in the summer this year. So as I said, the main challenge was demonstrating the material suitability of cast iron. Uh, that is a webinar on its own to explain. Uh, so I would defer to uh, my colleague uh, uh, and, and material science specialist, if that's a, a topic for further interest, I'm sure there'll be non knowledge dissemination on that side of things going forwards. Um, and as I said, the main outcome was that generalized evidence base uh, of operational safety for, for uh, representative uh, GB appliances. Okay, so now we're looking forwards. What's the uh, next steps to the full safety evidence base? So this shows a schematic of the physical system boundary for the gas networks in the UK. So you have the higher pressure tiers marked with HP coming down through the pressure tiers, intermediate, medium, and low pressure, and gas users uh, connected all across them. So you can see that domestics will be typically connected to the lowest pressure tiers, but interspersed with commercial and industrial sites that are a lot more complex and have other evidence requirements. Uh, and it's a bit in, impractical, impossible really, to try and segregate the network. You cannot say you're gonna supply a blend in a national scale to all domestic customers, but not the commercial and industrial sites next door as well. That, that would be physically impossible. Um, so what's the challenge? We have to get evidence for the whole uh, of this uh, system and the green areas highlighted on the slide show where we've covered the evidence to date um, in, in full readiness. Um, so the lowest pressure tiers in terms of the procedures, the materials, the appliances in the domestic and small commercials. And where's the next challenge? It's moving to these higher pressure tier procedures and materials where we are currently undergoing a comprehensive and rigorous review of all of those aspects uh, as part of the full evidence base and also the industrial and commercial um, sectors, which are my speciality and, and, and where I've been most involved in the project uh, is trying to push those those evidence pieces forwards. Um, so uh, we've the also the, the, the biggest challenge we face at the moment is how do you tie all of that together? in a consistent risk assessment methodology, uh, bringing together overall societal risks in terms of reducing the carbon monoxide emissions uh, and, and risks uh, from introducing blended gas uh, and offsetting any change in the fire explosion risks that people uh, experience from, from the different gas characteristics. Um, so the next slide um, just shows essentially the same sort of thing, uh, but with in terms of the depth. So, the industrial and commercial and the materials, we have some level of evidence to be able to do kind of controlled trials and case studies on those. And there's more, more info in the next slide on those. Um, and then the industrial and higher pressure procedure, sorry, the intermediate and higher pressure procedures uh, following. But where we consider we're almost ready for our unbounded deployment in the domestics, the lowest pressure and the downstream procedures that they're indicated there. Ultimately, all of these aspects need to be brought together to enable a policy decision and a national regulation change, as it says in, in the bottom box there. OK, so coming on to the industrial evidence base. Um, so various industrial trials are underway to understand any potential implications for industrial processes. So we have completed uh, a forced draft um, uh, furnace test with no issues identified with the right uh, burner characterization. Um, and also a five day trial at a 55 megawatt glass furnace up at Pilkington's glass. So that was a, a massive success. And there's a, there's a video that we're going to show on the next slide on that to explain it a bit more. Other trials we have in progress encompass other aspects of the industrial and commercial sphere. So a steam boiler at Unilever uh, up on the Wirral in, in northwest England uh, and also ceramics research work with Lucidian. Uh, baking and the food industry with Camden BRI and many other trials in development and studies, including on gas turbines, engines, burner categorizations, uh, standards reviews to try and tie all of these bits of evidence together. OK, so the next slide has the video now that I'll share on the Pilkington Glass trial. The 
trial that's taking place here at Cookington is to run a five-day trial for adding a hydrogen blend to the furnace here on site. What we're doing in these trials is we're blending 15% hydrogen into all the natural gas on the furnace. We're running these trials to assess the impact of the hydrogen on glass quality and furnace operation. Since 1990, the UK has successfully decarbonised by 45%, but in the industrial sector, very little progress has been made. And the reason is because they use high temperature heat. So in the furnace, we use 1600 degree heat, and therefore you can't decarbonise very easily without using combustion. That's where hydrogen comes in. Manufacturing sites and processes are a huge emitter of carbon across the UK and use massive amounts of natural gas in their processes. So trialling using a blend of hydrogen of up to 20% could potentially save an enormous amount of carbon. Hydrogen is able to decarbonise a process like a glass furnace because it doesn't have any carbon in the molecule. But because it's still a molecule that combusts, it produces very high temperatures. We have a, a big decarbonisation uh, agenda within the company. This is obviously a first step because we're only blending 20% by volume of hydrogen into all the natural gas on the furnace. But uh, ultimately, we would be looking at using higher percentages of hydrogen so that we could fully decarbonise the combustion processes on the furnace. We've been working with Pilkington for around 18 months now, trying to get all of the engineering and logistics sorted for this trial. We are currently midway through the trial. It will last a total of five days. The impact of using the hydrogen blend has had no impact on the actual product quality, which is, to be honest, what we were expecting it to be. We expected that once we'd made adjustments to the process to cope for the lower calorific value of the fuel, that we would then uh, be able to run our process as normal. So we were not expecting any impact on quality. Heavy industry is a really important sector to look at for decarbonisation. So if we take this trial for example, each day two tonnes of hydrogen will be consumed, which is the equivalent of providing the same blend to 30,000 homes. What we're hoping to demonstrate here is that heavy industry, like glass production, can be viably decarbonised with a hydrogen blend. A positive result from this trial will directly feed into the government process looking to sanction blending by 2023, which will then kickstart the hydrogen conversion journey of the UK. We're looking at about a 7% CO2 reduction overall uh, from using the blend. So it's relatively small, but it is a first step. And it also proves that when the North West switches over to a hydrogen blend, that the control systems and the operation will not be affected by that switch over to 20% hydrogen. Blending hydrogen into the gas mains is a really important step on the journey to get us to 100% hydrogen. It helps to grow the economy, it helps to provide confidence to investors and to customers and consumers and stakeholders. And also at Caden, we're preparing and getting ready for and planning for 100% hydrogen and making our network hydrogen ready for the future. Okay, so hopefully that was um, a, a, a useful video to see in terms of the industrial processes that, that can be decarbonized through the use of hydrogen, and in this case, as a blend on the way to 100% hydrogen. So that leads me on to the final uh, point, and I'm conscious of time, so this is the last slide. Um, how do we roll out hydrogen blending? What, what, what would that look like? So full-scale commercial delivery was, is going to require the build-out of supply and matching it with the demand. So the, um, the, the current plan within the UK is to lead on that through industrial decarbonisation clusters, such as the High Net Northwest cluster, um, which you see a schematic of here in the screen. Uh, that's a, a, a leading industrial decarbonisation cluster project um, led by Progressive Energy and with our project partners, uh, ENI, Cadent and SR, who we formed a joint venture with to produce low carbon hydrogen uh, at the Stanlow manufacturing uh, complex. So that showcases how downstream refinery operations uh, in the oil and gas and, and petroleum sectors uh, can move to decarbonisation and switch to being a, a, an energy production centre, disseminating that through hydrogen to decarbonise other processes around the cluster area. And what does blending mean? As it's shown here, blending can connect into those centres of production to increase the build out 
of that production, providing a market to a uh, demand to connect to, to the supply source. Um, and with that build out of supply, then means that we can get to a position where there is sufficient supply to have a 100% uh, conversion uh, because we're simultaneously relying on the security of the natural gas uh, network. So as it says there on, on the slide, it unlocks that demand and it breaks that link between demand and production um, to get things going and get things moving, breaking the chicken and egg cycle uh, that so far has held uh, the industry back. Um, so that concludes the presentation um, and High Deploy has been working, as I said, to unlock the safety case for this non-disruptive carbon uh, reduction for its gas customers uh, in the UK. And I'm very happy to take more questions um, in terms of the specific ones raised at the introduction uh, through the Q&A, but I will hand back now to Sujay um, for the other speakers. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Charles, for this wonderful insights on the High Deploy Blending Program of UK. Uh, participants are encouraged to post their questions in the Q&A tab and would be taking at the end of all the uh, three presentations. So moving forward, uh, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Mr. Ashu Singhal. Uh, Mr. Singhal is having an experience of over 30 years in the hydrocarbon sector and is presently heading corporate strategy, planning and advocacy, risk management and TQM departments at uh, Gale India Limited as executive director. Uh, Mr. Singhal is a mechanical engineer from NIT Silchar and also holds a master's degree in uh, business administration. So over to you, Mr. Singhal. Thank you, Sujay, and thank you, Mr. Singh, for the initial remarks and uh, also Charles for bringing out the perspective of UK and what the country is doing for uh, hydrogen building in the pipeline network and overall uh, plan of the uh, country to move ahead. So I will uh, start sharing my presentation. I hope it is visible. Yes, sir, yes. visible, sir. Okay. So uh, I will cover my presentation on two parts. One is giving a broad overview of India's energy sector and then moving on to the topic of hydrogen blending initiative. Now in this, uh, I mean, just for the benefit of the international audience and participants. So I will touch upon what is India's energy sector looks like and how we are moving ahead, what are the main plans and drivers for uh, taking uh, the country's uh, energy basket. So uh, as we know that we are the third largest primary energy consumer after China and US, and we are the fastest growing energy uh, consumer amongst the new countries which are coming up like Africa and China and India will be the key drivers to take the energy consumption forward in next two decades or so. The country is having low per capita and going forward we are seeing uh, the urbanization and standard of living are improving, so there will be requirement of a lot of energy in all forms, be it uh, fossil fuels or renewable energy and others. In India, we have a small uh, share of primary energy, uh, seven, around 7% 7 of gas in the primary energy basket, and the target is to move up to 15% in another 7-8 years time. So uh, currently we are consuming in India 764 million tons of oil equivalent. So if we go ahead and see what are the projections to uh, move ahead in, as per the BP stats by 2050, we are going to go up by more than double the energy consumption at the uh, CAGR of 3%, around 3%. So what we find is that coal consumption is expected to come down substantially and uh, it will be replaced by gas as well as uh, renewables. So these are the two main energy sources, which is likely to take up a major pie going forward in two or three decades. Mm -hmm. Now, the main vision for India and to steer it to make it more affordable, reliable and sustainable energy, there are several steps which are being taken up. One is to move, increase the share of gas in the primary energy basket. Second is to move to cleaner fossil, uh, cleaner fuels, fossil fuels like from the, uh, from move away from coal side to increase uh, biofuels uh, consumption in the total overall basket, then to move to a renewable energy of 450 gigawatt and uh, using electric vehicles to decarbonize and also using uh, the hydrogen as an emerging fuel, also digitizing innovation across the energy system. In COP26 also, uh, India have given uh, major pledges, which most of the people would be aware about it. And the key being that we are increasing the uh, 
uh, renewable energy sector and also reducing the emissions and also targeting uh, zero by 2070. Now, if we see how the gas is playing a role uh, in, it's a transition fuel. Currently, we are more focused, more uh, consuming coal and oil in the primary energy, but going forward, we then we are trying to increase biofuels, renewable and hydrogen in the overall mix and make it a less uh, impact on the economy as such, to make it a smooth transition. In India, we consume around uh, 160 mm CMD of gas, around uh, 60 BCM, and going forward, it is expected to grow much, much more. The main sectors which are consuming the gas is fertilizer, power, and CGD. And CGD will be the one which will play an important role. Almost 55% is LNG and balance is domestic gas. Now, gas is seen as a good fuel for India because we are replacing coal and oil also by gas in various things. It is good for import substitution, energy security, safe and convenient, environmental friendly, and affordable fuel. Although the affordability point is as of now, the gas prices are very unpredictable and very high. So affordability is actually a concern as of now. If we talk about infrastructure, almost 19,000 kilometer pipelines are there and another 14, 15,000 kilometers are expected to be ready. So we will have a rational gas grid, which will be in place in another four to five years of time. 60 billion uh, US dollar investment is expected to come in another seven to eight years time. And some of the major developments have been uh, introduction of gas exchange, e-bidding platform, and unification of tariff is under consideration. The main investments are expected in gas infrastructure and uh, biofuel and CGD networks. If we talk about the LNG regas terminals, so we have going to uh, more than almost 1.5 times of current capacity and double the gas pipeline network. Now, CGD network also is expected to go up substantially in coming years, and almost 95% of the country will be covered by the CGD distribution network, city gas distribution. Now, coming to the topic of uh, today's discussion, which is to see how, uh, what are the initiatives we are taking for blending hydrogen in the gas network. So, we have started a small beginning, but uh, an important one to say that India's first green hydrogen policy is in place in February 22. And uh, some of the major incentives offered are that waiver of interstate transmission charges, banking facility to the new power, and a clear formula for the charges and open access approval within a very short time. As we all know, hydrogen is an important fuel which will benefit the economy and the energy landscape of the country by energy security, integration with renewable energy, because renewable energy is uh, sometimes it cannot be supplied to the grid and needs to be curtailed. At that point of time, it can be used uh, to produce hydrogen, and which can be also good to decarbonize hard to abate sector. And it will help in the climate change issues, related issues, and other advantages which we already know. The main challenge for hydrogen is the affordability and transportation, which I will cover in some of my subsequent slides. So in India, we are seeing a lot of interest and enthusiasm from various, various companies and various industries to come in and put in their, uh, put in their efforts to make this hydrogen mission actually happen. Like in uh, green hydrogen chemical production, we have several private companies and other players who are bringing up different projects of various magnitude to see that hydrogen uh, plays some substantial part in the energy mix. The second bracket is, bucket is about the electrolyzer and other manufacturing equipment, where again we find many, com many companies are putting their efforts to do this. Other is the green hydrogen value chain and electrolyzer. So Gail uh, also is exploring some opportunities to come into this, whereas international and Indian companies are working in collaboration to make that actually happen. And finally, on the gas hydrogen blending, the NTPC, Gail, Bharat Petroleum, Indian Oil, HPCL, and IGL. These are more or less the government companies, uh, public sector companies, as we call them in India, and some private pairs to see in a pilot in a pilot scale, we are starting and going for ahead. Once the regulations are more 
more mature as well as in international experiences are also gained we will go for uh, scaling up the mixing of hydrogen into the gas blends so in hydrogen blending the, some measures have been taken for uh, seeing how hydrogen can be mixed into the existing gas pipeline network some initiatives i will cover in some of my slides then how hydrogen can be produced from renewable other sources which can be in injected and not just the gray hydrogen and finally uh, we have cng we have implemented in hcng that is hydrogen mixed with the cng and some vehicles some buses were run to successfully test the 20% of uh, by volume weight it can be take take up without any or much changes in the vehicle or efficiency now coming to gales initiative on how what we are doing in uh, hydrogen blending with respect to one of our initiative in place in the central india we have we have started this project uh, last 6 7 months back and now we have already commissioned in january 22 the it's a city gas distribution company which is avantika gas limited and this is a pilot project where we have uh, got the approval from the regulators we have taken approval from the safety uh, agencies as well as finding the designing and all other mechanisms which were internally required to make it a full proof system and uh, we got full support from government side and the state administration and this project has recently started so we have started got a permission to blend up to 2% and the city gas distribution avantika gas is going to gives Uh, this gas is being supplied to both uh, pipe natural gas cng that is compressed natural gas as well as commercial uh, application and industrial application so we have a different arena of customers who is taking this blended hydrogen and uh, some of this is just a pilot scale and can be scaled up if based on the results and availability of hydrogen and also the affordability so this project was started uh, with this average flow of 0.12 mm cmd of gas in this particular network and almost 120 kg per day is being uh, blended and we have uh, on 1.1% initial blending percent and this is being supplied to all the cgd customers as as i mentioned earlier now we have also taken out the performance reporting of some of the test which we carried out in this last two or three months and we found that the pipeline thickness has not at all uh, impacted because of this although it is very mature to say that what will be the long term impact of hydrogen blending which uh, several research are being done in different parts of the globe also to see what could be the impact of non long term basis but uh, in in a small in a long medium to short term basis we have found that not much is uh, getting impacted as far as the uh, wall thickness is concerned on the pipelines we have also taken feedback from various customers to whom this blended hydrogen was uh, hydrogen uh, natural gas was being supplied and we did not found much impact till this percentage also we are taking up steady in 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 hydrogen blending in the natural gas pipeline network and also the cgd network from reputed public sector undertaking in gay uh, in india which is ingenious in their limited and they have done their preliminary analysis it is still going on they will do out further analysis and come out with a final report in few months but on the basic and on at the outset they have said almost 5% of hydrogen blending can be done in in api 5l grade uh, x52 pipes and uh, also they have considered what will be the impact on line line pack and other fittings which are deployed into the pipeline network so as of now 5% can be blended from the pipeline integrity perspective from the initial assessments which we have done. for the instrument side almost up to 20% blending is acceptable and from compressors and drive it is as of now it is 3% of hydrogen with modifications we are in touch with the oems the original equipment manufacturers and we are in touch with uh, several institutes and other labs to carry out several uh, test and pilot bases to see what is the impact on uh, accelerated degeneration of uh, hydrogen in the blending and apparatus which we are using to find out what will be the
So if we have also done some study on the CNG kits and we found that 20% uh, mixing does not have any impact on the engine recalibration for the buses which were running on SCNG. Also the uh, kits are also not to be, there's no overalling also required up to 20% uh, mixing of hydrogen and hazard analysis has also been done. And we found that 5% of hydrogen blending in natural gases observed, which is similar as the pure natural gas mixing, which we have done earlier. Now, some of the challenges which, has, which we found uh, are to be addressed if we have to make it and scale up the blending in a much bigger manner. One is that uh, different end use segments and what is the long-term impact on these segment needs to be established. In the cost of prediction of green hydrogen, somebody has to take uh, that cost, someone has to bear that cost. And particularly so if the power is coming from renewable energy side, that green hydrogen, the cost becomes much higher. Then some of the re regulations needs to be framed in India as well as from others also standards, safety standards, if we increase the mixing in, in the natural gas uh, pipeline grid, what is the impact on the fittings and appliances as well as the end use in where the gas is being supplied. Then there's no assurance as of now of, of taking hydrogen due to its high cost, which is the affordability issue. Then some, uh, some time lag is required for implementing these uh, projects and nowhere in the globe we have found that what is the technical suitability of hydrogen blending in X60 and above grades. So this, if we can get some data from UK or US or our international peers, that what is uh, the likelihood of impact uh, on higher grade steels of blending? So that needs to be established because transporting hydrogen from one point to the from the point of production to the customer side is a painful process and needs. If uh, pipeline network can do that, then it is the easiest way to achieve it. Some of uh, other companies who have, in India who have taken initiative to go ahead with the pilot or blending project. One of them is NTPC, which Mr. Singh mentioned in his initial remark also that in NTPC Kawas, they are uh, existing one megawatt solar project is being put up. And once this is commissioned, they will put up the electrolyzer and start supplying that uh, gas, blended hydrogen gas in the petrol pipe natural gas in their own township. This will be blending up to around 5%. Uh, some of the other initiative which Gail is taking is we are putting up an electrolyzer of 10 megawatt capacity in central India. The tender is already on and uh, we, are, we are using evading, doing some evaluation and this project is expected to take another one and a half year time for implementation, around one, one year to one and a half year. So we expect ordering by another one month or so and then implementation will start. And this, we are trying to have a blend of uh, solar-based power to run this electrolyzers. And based on its success and the experience and learning, we can scale up this. Our uh, city gas distribution company, which is in the first gas limited in New Delhi, they are also doing conducting a study for three city, city gas stations for blending of uh, hydrogen in city gas network. And in future, they have a plan to scale up to 50 megawatt capacity. Then Gale is exploring some electrolyzer manufacturing in India also for producing green hydrogen. We have also exploring in the Eastern part of the country in Odisha to uh, do an end-to-end -end project, right? From production of green hydrogen to blending or producing uh, ammonia with that uh, green hydrogen. And finally, uh, we have engaged Engineers India Limited to do a more broad scale, uh, broad based study on finding what is the what is the likely impact of hydrogen in the broad uh, gas based gas network which is existing in the country. So the report is still not finalized. They are uh, trying to uh, do it a more exhaustive study because a uh, lot many labs does not have these facilities to do all these tests also. So some time is uh, still more required, maybe another few months to finalize this study. And with after this study and also seeing the developments happening across other parts of the world, we will take a further more uh, calculated decision 
major decision of how to go ahead with these projects. Some of other uh, big uh, public sector undertaking like IOCL is going uh, in a big manner to make their refineries uh, move from uh, current hydrogen, which is being produced as a part of process to green hydrogen. And this they will be doing in a phase manner in the next four, seven to eight years time. Similarly, uh, solid municipal solid to waste hydrogen projects are also being explored. Then some of the hydrogen dispensing stations are being put up at Gujarat refinery and other places where uh, it can be started with. Similarly, Bharat Petroleum and Hindustan Petroleum were the other OMCs in India, oil marketing companies. They are also putting up green hydrogen based production facilities in their refineries. And uh, after some of these are set up and based on the experience, they can be scaled. Now, uh, one more project which has happened in India is about HCNG, that is hydrogen blended uh, CNG, which was implemented in July 19 by IOCL and I, IGL, that is uh, City Gas Distribution Company of a joint venture of GAIL. So there, that was uh, successfully run for some time and now based on the study, a detailed report is being uh, analyzed and it will be put up to the regulators and other other authorities to find what is the next steps in blending of hydrogen in the CNG component. So uh, if we look in the last uh, few slides about what is the outlook for India and how we are going to go ahead, what is government's plan to take this hydrogen mission forward is one that they have made some broad outlook and contours of how we will be as a country moving ahead in the hydrogen mission and how to cut down the carbon emissions. Multifold initiatives are being taken in terms of uh, going to more gas consumption in the primary energy, going for more biofuel based consumption than hydrogen, electric vehicles. So it's a mix of all the initiatives to make it more sustainable solution for the country because we have to see the issue related to the affordability. We have to see that infrastructure is built at the least carbon intensive footprint. We have to also see that it is access to available to most part of the country. And also we have to also evaluate what are the resources available in the country. So that places us in a very unique situation, which uh, India is trying to evolve in Niti Aayog and other ministries, trying to find out a solution for smooth transition from current uh, coal oil based economy to gas and the renewable side. Other things which are happening is uh, promoting production, storage, transportation and utilization of green hydrogen, promoting R&D expenditures in the hydrogen production and coal value chain. Then there are uh, mandatory obligations for fertilizer refinery and CGD sector to gradually move to a green hydrogen in their overall consumption. And the other uh, transportation sector studies are being done by Gale and other companies to see how we can start mixing hydrogen in the pipeline networks. But still, to sum it up that we are still in a very nascent stage and several things needs to be done by various uh, stakeholders to make it actually happen and make it more sustainable and affordable solution for India. So coming to my last slide, we have, as I mentioned that, uh, our green hydrogen mission is already in place with emphasis on R&D expenditure and investments in various value chain. Second part is that producing hydrogen from renewable energy. India is going up to 500 gigawatt of renewable energy by another five, six years. So that type of energy, once it comes into the grid, one of the solution is hydro for balancing it or storage, battery storage or hydrogen. So whichever is coming fast and more affordable will finally find a space. Then I mentioned about the green hydrogen consumption obligations are being put up in uh, three main sectors, which is fertilizer, refinery, and uh, city gas distribution. By 2030 and 2035, we'll move up to maybe 50% of their whole, uh, whatever hydrogen they're consuming to be replaced by green hydrogen. So Federal regulatory policy and other standards are being uh, revisited in India to see that we are up to uh, up to date to make it happen as in when the 
related issues related to affordability, the technical constraints, the relation, uh, the technical constant relation to mixing and other things as and when they are sorted out, we will start, we will be in a position to launch this uh, hydrogen blending and other such initiative, which is there, which are being done in a pilot or a research mode as of now. And finally, we find that hydrogen is one of the main uh, solution for hardware bed sectors like steel and long haul haulage transport and also shipping. So overall, it's a very good sweet space that uh, we find India to be, to take it uh, in a more, uh, more professional manner and try to feed in with various data which we get from our global peers and whatever best uh, we can to make uh, least uh, impact on the environment with respect to whatever more infrastructure needs to be developed or trying to decarbonize and also to impact the local pollution levels, which is very severe in some of the cities in the country. So I hope uh, I, I have made some of the points and it's, it was a more brief presentation. I will be happy to take whatever uh, questions that do come up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Singhal, for giving us an Indian perspective on the blending and the initiatives being carried out in this direction. Now, let me invite our third speaker. We'll talk about the Highblend project of US. Uh, Mr. Ivan Reznicek is a hydrogen system analyst at National Renewable Energy Laboratory US. Ivan received a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Kansas and master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from Colorado School of Mines. Over to you, Ivan. All right, thank you for the introduction. Just try to get my screen shared. All right. So while I'm getting this going, I'd also like to highlight uh, my colleagues, Kevin Topolsky and Mark Chung, who've also contributed to some of the work that I'll be talking about today. Um, so first, I'll give a little bit of a background on NREL. So NREL, or the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, is a U.S. Department of Energy national lab. Um, got about 3,000 people located here in Golden, Colorado. Um, a mixture of researchers, postdoctoral researchers, and graduate and undergraduate students. And we partner quite a bit with industry, academia, and the government to advance science and engineering on renewable energy, sustainable transportation, energy efficiency, and energy systems integration. And hydrogen um, at NREL, hydrogen research at NREL typically fits into the sustainable transportation umbrella, although we are increasingly, uh, through projects like Highblend, working in the energy systems integration space. My team specifically works in hydrogen systems analysis. So our activities provide direction, insight, and support for the development, demonstration, and deployment of hydrogen technologies. Our analysis focuses on a variety of applications, and I have some of those and relevant tools that we've produced listed here. Hydrogen production, hydrogen dispensing stations, electrical grid energy storage, hydrogen supply chain analysis, and then operational optimization of hydrogen and energy storage systems. So the US Department of Energy um, has this H2S scale initiative, which envisions a robust future hydrogen economy that complements the electric grid. And so hydrogen, as many of you know, is an energy carrier that can be used for a number of applications, heat and distributed power, chemical and industrial processes, metals productions, fertilizer production can be used to produce fuels or as a fuel in fuel cell electric vehicles. And hydrogen can be produced from electricity or can be used to produce electricity. And then most of the hydrogen right now is produced from natural gas in the US. Um, and so there's potentially some synergy with natural gas because the US has very extensive natural gas infrastructure. Um, approximately 3 million miles of natural gas pipeline that's compared to roughly 1600 miles of dedicated hydrogen pipeline. Um, the U.S. currently produces about 10 million metric tons of hydrogen per day, mostly for refining and fertilizer production, and primarily using uh, reforming of natural gas. However, there is a significant push to develop low-carbon alternatives 
using water electrolysis, steam methane reforming with CCS and methane pyrolysis. Uh, but a large challenge for hydrogen deployment, as we know, is the transmission and distribution of that hydrogen. And this is where this, this natural gas infrastructure could come in handy in the US because in the context of trying to achieve economy-wide decarbonization by 2050, um, a lot of this infrastructure uh, could essentially become stranded assets. So the Hive Blender Initiative aims to address some of the challenges associated with hydrogen blending. And as we know, a lot of these challenges are dependent on the condition and materials of pipelines, um, the infrastructure in those pipelines, so compressor stations, valves, meters, et cetera, and then the applications that utilize natural gas currently. Now, in the US, we have a, a significant mixture of transmission pipelines that operate at high pressure. Uh, those are generally made of steel, and some of them are very old, dating back to the 1950s. Um, we also have a lot of distribution networks that are primarily composed of plastic or polyethylene piping. And the goal here is potentially to blend renewably produced hydrogen into either transmission pipelines or distribution networks, uh, or a bit of both. But there are a lot of uncertainties around how hydrogen will affect these pipes and pipeline components. And I think one of the themes that I'm going to emphasize in this presentation today is there's a, definitely a need for case-by-case -case analysis. Um, we can't just assign a, a flat blending percentage to the entire network. So this project is co-funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and Industry. It has a 15 million U.S. dollar R&D portfolio. Um, we have over 20 industry partners and six national laboratories involved in this project. There are four primary national labs that are leading this project. NREL is the overall program lead in providing techno-economic analysis. Argonne National Lab is providing environmental impact or life cycle assessment analysis, emissions analysis. And then we also have teams at Sandia National Laboratory and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory working on metallic and polymeric testing respectively. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the objectives of these different teams within this project. So the metals team at Sandia National Lab is primarily focusing on uh, improving our understanding of crack growth, fatigue, and fracture of steel pipe materials through structural integrity and risk assessment of these pipelines. So they're developing a probabilistic fracture mechanics framework to assess structural integrity of natural gas infrastructure. You know, as you can imagine, it's very dependent on the population density of defects and things like that. So there's a need to be able to perform sensitivity analyses and characterize the variability in crack growth rates and fracture toughness of these materials in these different conditions with different defect populations. They're also focusing on degradation of structural properties, um, performing a lot of uh, failure assessments, to try to evaluate the critical parameters that are going to contribute to hydrogen assisted fatigue and fracture and develop a physics based model that can really capture this hydrogen embrittlement process. The polymeric team at Pacific Northwest National Lab and Sandia National Lab uh, also will be focusing on degradation and lifetime of plastic materials. So they're going to be doing testing of these materials in hydrogen and natural gas blends, looking at joining technologies and trying to understand how we can predict the lifetime of these, of these materials operating in hydrogen and hydrogen natural gas blends. Now, our work at NREL is focused primarily on the economics. And so some of the questions we want to answer are things like, what upgrades are required for pipelines in order to reach a certain blending ratio? And what are the associated costs? So for example, or I should say to, to try to address this, this question, we're developing a flexible open source tool that will be capable of estimating the costs necessary to achieve a given hydrogen blend in a given system. So this is gonna be a case by case tool. Um, it will capture the various important supply chain segments of the natural gas infrastructure, things like storage, facilities, compressors, the pipe itself, meters, valves, et cetera. And we're going to use gas network models within this framework in order to understand how does hydrogen concentration change along the pipeline? Um, what are the flows, the pressures? These things will all be necessary in order to understand what modifications need to be made. And we'll also need to incorporate research from the materials teams to identify 
um, which segments need to be prioritized. Another question is, what is the overall revenue opportunity or the, the value statement of hydrogen blending? And so we have a number of models at NREL that can be used to look at some of these high level questions. Like when you, you integrate electrolyzers with both um, the grid and the natural gas network, how can we capture the, the effects of that, right? And so we can use power production cost models and natural gas simulators uh, along with electrolysis models in order to estimate the revenue opportunities of hydrogen blending and explore the impacts of blending on the, these integrated systems. So how does, how does adding a bunch of electrolysis load affect electricity prices? And how does blending hydrogen affect gas prices? And there's a, a cyclical nature to these things. And so can we establish how that's going to play out over time as we try to decarbonize the electricity grid and the economy overall? And then finally, are there alternative pathways that we should be considering? Um, one option could be instead of modifying natural gas infrastructure to accommodate hydrogen, we could take hydrogen and CO2 and use that to produce synthetic natural gas and inject that into the current natural gas grid instead. And so in that case, you're not spending as much on pipeline upgrades, but the you're, instead you're spending on, on producing this synthetic natural gas fuel. So what are the trade-offs there? Does one or the other make more sense uh, in terms of overall cost and emissions. So now I'll talk about a few preliminary results and findings, uh, starting with materials. This project has only been going for about six months. So we've primarily been uh, getting spooled up on models and um, doing literature reviews. But our colleagues over at Sandia National Lab have uh, looked at the materials aspects of, um, particularly the steel material aspects of hydrogen blending quite extensively. And so we know that fatigue crack growth rates are going to increase in the presence of hydrogen. And, and what we have seen is that for low stress intensity factors or low loads on the pipe, um, fatigue crack growth generally scales with the square root of hydrogen partial pressure. And this happens even at low hydrogen partial pressures as low as one bar. At higher stress intensity factors, however, we see that fatigue crack growth rate is actually independent of hydrogen partial pressure. And so for pipelines operating under high stress environments, the impact of one bar of hydrogen partial pressure is approximately the same as 200 bar. And I should note that rigorously uh, should really be considering fugacity instead of partial pressure, but it's a bit of a side note. Another thing that we can take away from this is that fatigue crack growth rate does not depend on steel grade. Um, so the steel grade is really secondary to the overall stress intensity. If we look at fracture resistance or fracture toughness, here we see a, a little bit more variability with steel grade. There's a general trend with somewhat limited data that shows that as you increase tensile strength of a metal, the fracture resistance decreases. So I think this is fairly well understood that um, you know, higher strength steels tend to have more problems with hydrogen. We generally assume that the fracture resistance um, follows the square root dependence on fugosity. And so that means that there's a very steep decrease in fracture resistance as you add low amounts of hydrogen, get to a low partial pressure of hydrogen. But then as you increase hydrogen beyond that, it's, it's more of a modest decrease. So once again, there's more of a significant impact going from no hydrogen to small amounts of hydrogen than from going from small amounts of hydrogen to large amounts. We also see that fatigue and fracture properties of welds are generally consistent with base metals. Um, so some overall takeaways here are that while partial pressure of hydrogen uh, and steel grade both have a modest impact on these structural properties, these properties can vary much more sig significantly with the history and structure of the pipeline and its operating conditions. So, you know, does the pipeline have a lot of defects? Does it have a lot of stress concentrations? Is it operating at high pressure? You know, these defects and design aspects of, of pipelines are kind of more dictating in a pipeline's ability, at least a steel pipeline's ability to handle hydrogen. Uh, but we really, we really need better characterization of those, of those aspects and, and of more types of, of steels used uh, in US transmission pipelines. Now on the polymer side, um, there's been some testing performed with structural properties. Uh, generally has found no significant effects at low pressure. Um, 
but really there needs to be more thorough evaluation of that. There's also been some testing that suggests that hydrogen can change the density and degree of crystallinity of some of these materials, but the extent to which that affects mechanical properties is unknown, and the trends are often different for different polyethylene materials. So again, more testing is needed here for us to be able to definitively say what the impacts of hydrogen on these materials are. I'll talk some about some of the operational and economic research that we've uh, been investigating as we kick off this project. Uh, I can start with talking about some of the, the thermodynamic properties of hydrogen compared to natural gas or methane. So hydrogen has a much lower energy density. It's roughly one third of that of methane. Um, and so if you try to blend hydrogen into natural gas, maintaining a consistent pressure drop, you're going to have a reduction in energy transmission capacity. Um, hydrogen also has a lower Wobbe index, and so at some point you may need to start tuning burners and end use appliances to accommodate for that. Hydrogen also has a much lower viscosity, which actually is kind of helpful um, for at least transmission because this means that you can have a higher flow rate at an equivalent pressure drop, and that helps to partially make up for the lower volumetric energy density of hydrogen. It has a much broader flammability limit, so if hydrogen is mixed anywhere between 4 and 75% by volume with air, it can ignite. That's compared to a range of 4 to 17% for natural gas. Um, so much broader range of conditions in which it's flammable, which brings around concerns around leaks and safety. Has a much higher flame speed and adiabatic flame temperature. And so flashback and NOx emissions can become more of a concern if they're not properly accounted for. It also has a negative Joule-Thompson coefficient, which means that the temperature actually increases upon expansion instead of decreasing, which is what happens for most gases. And then it also has an invisible flame, which brings up another safety concern. There's also been quite a bit of research done on what are the effects of blending hydrogen on um, pipeline hydraulics, thermodynamics, and heat transfer. Here I'm highlighting some research performed by um, researchers at uh, GRT gas and solar turbines. Um, so they looked at blending hydrogen, looking at various hydrogen concentrations in a pipeline with fixed pressure drop. And what they found is that as you increase hydrogen concentration, the volumetric flow rate will increase. Um, it is worth noting that this will result in a fluid velocity increase, and you do need to be somewhat wary of uh, erosional velocity limits, a, a point at which the, the velocity of the fluid could actually cause some erosion within the pipe. They also observed roughly a 15 to 20 percent reduction in energy transmission capacity at 100 percent hydrogen. And so that's not quite as bad as that, you know, one third energy capacity or um, volumetric energy density of hydrogen. They also found that maintaining constant energy transmission capacity requires um, a higher pipeline pressure. I mean, this, this is kind of inferred by the fact that if you keep pressure drop constant, you see a reduction in volumetric um, or overall energy flow. They also found that if they look at the temperature downstream, as you increase hydrogen concentration, that increases some. Um, this could be an issue for compressors since their performance is highly dependent on inlet temperature. And this study also did look at uh, hydrogen compressors. Now it's worth noting that hydrogen has a much lower molecular weight than natural gas. So at an equivalent temperature and pressure, it's going to have much lower density and low density gases require more work to compress. And so if you look at uh, kind of a system wide energy requirements of transmitting hydrogen, if, if you're going to transmit the same amount of energy via hydrogen, you need almost 300% more compression work in order to do that. This also impacts centrifugal compressors. Um, so in order to maintain the same pressure rise, they'll need to increase in speed, um, which could become a limitation because the speed limits on centrifugal compressors are often related to the impeller stress constraints. Um, and so it, it, the extent to which a centrifugal compressor is going to be able to tolerate hydrogen is going to depend a lot on what its overspeed specifications are. In this particular study for this compressor, they found that they could blend about 17 or 18 percent hydrogen before they hit their maximum speed limit on this compressor. We've also reviewed a lot of prior economic studies on hydrogen blending. Most of these assume that it's possible to blend up to 5 to 15 percent without any modifications. Um, and 
and they've looked at the amount of hydrogen that could be produced and the amount of renewables that could be integrated, what emissions reductions are possible. Um, and I, I think they've generally shown that it, it could be possible to blend hydrogen and save money and reduce emissions and integrate more renewables. Um, but I think particularly in the context of transmission networks, it's, you know, we really need to be capturing these other costs that, that we can kind of expect at this point um, based on what we know about materials performance. There are a few studies that have attempted to capture these, these, um, these costs. There's one in particular from 2018 that I think is worth noting um, that actually uses the ASME B31.12 design code for pure hydrogen pipelines to assess if existing hydrogen pipelines, or sorry, if existing natural gas pipelines could function with hydrogen and still be under code. Um, but that study was really limited to uh, steel pipelines and compressor replacements. There are a number of other components within transmission lines that need to be assessed. And then obviously distribution networks that operate at much lower pressures or something else entirely. And so in order to understand the economics of, of this proposition of hydrogen blending, we really need to balance operating expenses such as in complete, increased compression work for transmission lines, increased inspection frequency to check for defects um, and understand to what extent they are increasing capital expenditures for pipeline replacements, compressor station replacements, um, modifications to end use appliances and meters and things like that. And then also opportunity costs that may come with reduced energy transmission capacity. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of our planned techno-economic work. Um, so as I said, we're planning on developing a pipeline preparation cost tool that can assess some of these costs on individual pipeline networks. That's going to interface with a natural gas grid model to capture the um, how the composition propagates through the pipeline network and what the pressures and flows are that we need in order to evaluate if these pipelines can function with the proposed amount of hydrogen or if they need to be replaced or modified. Um, however, this overall system is, is more complex than that because as you introduce electrolyzers, you are introducing another point of connection between the natural gas grid and electricity grids. And so, you know, in the context of economy-wide decarbonization, um, implementing, you're replacing virtually all natural gas with hydrogen could pose a significant additional load on the electricity grid. And we're still figuring out how do we meet that demand for electricity? How does that impact electricity prices? And so through combining production cost modeling of the electricity grid with um, simulation of the natural gas grid and then price taker modeling of electrolysis facilities, we can try to get a better sense of how the economics of this overall system will play out in the context of deeply decarbonized future energy systems. As I mentioned earlier, we're also um, going to be looking at the synthetic natural gas pathway. So if we take hydrogen, electricity, and CO2 and produce SNG or RNG, if you're using renewable electricity um, for this approach, what are the costs? What are the emissions? Um, in what regions might this make sense? For what end use applications could it make sense? Um, can we capture leakage and fugitive emissions of both hydrogen and natural gas in this approach? Does it make sense from an, from an economic and emissions perspective relative to blending or just building um, new pure hydrogen pipelines? So to summarize what I've discussed, uh, I think there are a few key takeaways that we have consensus on regarding transmission systems. Um, we know that hydrogen has an impact on, on steel structural properties. However, the concentration and steel grade are less important than the overall stress and pipeline condition and designs of, of pipelines. Um, so if a pipeline can handle some hydrogen, it can probably handle quite a bit. Uh, we know that blending hydrogen will probably reduce transmission um, network overall capacity, especially if pipes have to be derated and it will probably increase compression energy and centrifugal compressor compatibility is going to be very dependent on their speed and impeller stress constraints. So key areas of future research for us include characterization of both steel and polyethylene material performance in a variety of relevant environments. Um, on the economic side, developing an open source tool to, dem to determine costs of upgrading pipelines and then assessing the overall value statement and decarbonization potential of hydrogen blending in 
um, the broader context of the grid, electricity grid and natural gas network. So thank you for, for the time and your attention. I'll turn it back to you guys. Thank you, Ivan, for giving us a brief about the Hybrid project. Uh, now let's move to the Q&A session. Uh, we have received a lot of questions, uh, basically on the impact of hydrogen on the system and the percentage of uh, hydrogen that can be used. So my uh, first question to the panelists uh, is that, uh, based on the research and pilot projects till now, what do you think is the uh, target percentage of hydrogen that can be blended uh, without major modifications in the system? So, Go on, shall I? Yeah, Charles, uh, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll start from the UK perspective. Um, so as, as we mentioned, 20% is the target for uh, the high deploy project and, and for the UK system, and that's based on the standards uh, history. So I think it will be location specific. And certainly, as, as Evan mentioned in, in his very good um, uh, talk there, um, it depends on the transmission uh, system or the, 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 the pressure tiers. So whether you're at a higher pressure transmission system uh, and the stress intensities or the distribution system, the high deploy project is focused only on the distribution uh, system within our scope. Um, and there is another project in the UK uh, covering the transmission system called High NTS. Um, and the, the, the sort of developing view is that at that transmission uh, level, the first case would probably be about 5% without any modifications uh, required, but I'm not as close to the, to the detail on that. But certainly from a distribution perspective, we are aiming for 20% in the UK uh, because that's the, it's, it's appliance driven, but it's also consistent with the evidence we have so far in terms of the material suitability and what's on the network. And once you start to, start to get to higher percentages, then um, some of the material challenges become uh, more, more relevant and there would likely to be some um, uh, you know, changes required. Um, in terms of the evidence that we've generated, and are generating, we are feeding that into the iGEM technical library. So the, uh, the part of our project is, is, is contributing to standards updates as we go. So iGEM is the Institute of Gas and Engineer, uh, Gas Engineers and Managers in the UK, and their standards govern the, uh, the um, distribution uh, networks and in terms of you know, materials of construction, et cetera. And they are producing hydrogen supplements to their existing standards. So that standards process is, is what incorporates, I think, the evidence generated by projects such as ours. And I'll hand over back to you. Okay, thank you, Charles. And uh, uh, Ivan, for the high plan project, it's uh, the target percentage is same, 20% uh, or it is uh, a higher or lower uh, side? Yeah, so, um... We haven't, I don't know that we have an established blend target. Um, I would echo everything that Charles just said that, you know, for distribution lines, I think it's, um, you know, 15, 20%, it, it's much more driven by appliances. On the transmission side, it, it, it's much more driven by the materials and the pressure. Um, so it, I think it's worth noting that in the US, uh, Hawaii gas has actually been operating with about 15% hydrogen, 12 to 15% by volume hydrogen in a steel transmission line for about 50 years. However, they're only operating at about 30% of SMICE. So we have other pipeline operators in the US that are already operating at 72% SMICE with natural gas. Um, they really don't have, I mean, if they, they can't blend hydrogen without having some impact, either having to reduce, um, reduce pressure or, um, or derate, reduce pressure or replace pipelines and, and any kind of, assessment of, of blending in transmission lines is going to require uh, a lot of inspection. Um, and if pipelines can't be inspected because of, you know, the nature that they were developed, um, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, then they're going to need to have those sections of the pipeline modified so that they can be inspected. So I think for transmission lines, it really depends on what pressure they're operating at already. Um, so. Okay, and uh, the next question is, any additives are being added to check for the blended gas leakage? So I'll, I'll start on that one. So uh, as I mentioned in the Keel University trial, we were testing the rhinology, so the odorant uh, impact. Natural gas already contains uh, an odorant injected um, and that's what causes the smell. It, it, it's not methane that smells, it, it's the additive. So what we were testing for was, um, does the introduction of 20% uh, volume blend change that substantially to change the uh, 
the, uh, the, the smell characteristics? And ultimately the answer is it didn't. And that's because uh, the human nose works on a logarithmic scale. So the, um, the sort of sensory impact of, uh, of, of the additive is so strong uh, that just blending with 20% volume doesn't move you significantly on, on the logarithm. And that's why we can smell quite low concentrations of things and as well as smelling high concentrations of things. So uh, obviously in a 100% hydrogen world, the same additive uh, or, or an alternative would need to be inputted to the 100% to the hydrogen so that it did have an odor, but the impact of blending at least up to 20% was uh, not substantive. Uh, and that was done by a desktop calculations, but we also had uh, sample points where professional sniffers uh, went round and smelled and, and in their professional opinion, uh, there was no change. Okay, so and the next question is, uh, what is the units of measurement for hydrogen blended gas to various customers like domestics and industrials? Uh, yeah. I, I think it depends. So um, it's all interchangeable, isn't it? We um, typically in the UK gas network measure on uh, standard cubic, cubic meters. Um, but as the other project that I'm uh, the project lead on is a hydrogen village project, and mostly I operate that on a, a mass or an energy basis uh, for making equivalent uh, calculations. Um, so it really depends on on your um, perspective and, and what you're trying to do with the data. Ultimately, they can all be converted. Okay. And uh, the next question is, uh, what kind of safety requirements does uh, blending has to meet? Yeah, Charles, Ivan, anyone can. Yeah. Like that one again. Uh, what kind of safety requirements does bl blending uh, has to meet? Okay, um, so so broadly, uh, from the uh, the high deployment perspective, there's two major risks, um, major categories of, of risks. You've got uh, essentially leakage and then fire and explosion uh, results, or you've got um, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, hazards based on the combustion, um, and so you need to take the relevant protocols to, to mitigate any changes in characteristics from those. So for instance, um, the leakage dispersion and the flammability limits are slightly different with blended gas um, versus natural gas. So that would impact things like your DSEER, or sorry, it's a UK acronym, your hazardous area kind of classifications and the uh, electrical uh, ratings and ignition of equipment. Um, so you need to consider the zones uh, relative to those leak areas um, and the material suitability to determine the frequency of leakage. But from a combustion perspective, uh, hydrogen has obviously a very good impact on carbon monoxide poisoning risks. So uh, as hydrogen obviously doesn't have any carbon in the molecule, it therefore cannot produce carbon monoxide, which is, is the hazardous um, uh, part of the, uh, you know, the, the, the risk that, that we're worried about. Um, when you blend up to 20%, um, you get upwards of a 90% reduction in CO emissions when an appliance is operating in a fault condition because of the fixed air and fuel volumetric ratio that works on and the fact that a hydrogen itself has a lower theoretical air requirement versus natural gas. So hydrogen is a step towards uh, ultimately safer from a carbon monoxide poisoning uh, risk and then the fire and explosion risks need to be managed accordingly um, so that the overall risk level is not introduced at increased rather. And uh, one uh, one question, uh, last question uh, from the high deploy or high blend uh, project perspectives, uh, blending up to certain percent is uh, expected to require small technical modifications of the gas grid, home appliances and equipment. So in short or in brief, can you uh, uh, tell more about the modifications, kind of modifications uh, it requires into the system, uh, the gas grid, home appliances and equipments? I guess I can start here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think as as Charles was kind of talking about, you know, with distribution lines and networks, you you know, you can probably do a certain amount before you run into appliance constraints. And so, um, I think tuning those those appliances at some point becomes necessary um, if you want to have more than 15, 20 percent hydrogen on the transmission side. Um, you know, I, I really think it, you have to start off with a really detailed assessment of, of pipelines to understand 
what are the defects, where are they, um, really characterize, characterize those materials. Uh, and if, prob if, if possible, try, to, try to, to estimate, you know, how much does your probability of, of fracture in, those, in some of those materials increase, um, particularly if you, if you need to, um, you may need to modify a pipeline in order to be pickable, in order, for, in order to be able to do the inline inspections. Um, you know, meters and valves may need to be may need to be modified or replaced. Um, so meters probably need to be assessed on a case by case basis, working with OEMs to determine if they'll still be accurate with hydrogen. Um, I think that one of the first places, you know, assuming that your pipeline is operating at, at low enough pressure that it, that it doesn't need to be replaced in order to to operate with hydrogen, and that it doesn't have enough defects that that those are problematic you know the, the compressors become a major point of, of focus um, because I think that's an area where you you may run into issues with the, um, the the low molecular weight of hydrogen impacting compressor speed and um, overall compression work and so if the the prime movers the 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 gas engines or or electric motors that are driving those compressors are are th those could become a limiting factor as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'd echo everything Evan, Evan said there, uh, principally for the sort of downstream side of things, the, the limited modifications we've, we've noted at up to 20% is around the gas detection and flame detection um, uh, aspects. And obviously those challenges have become higher with movement to 100% hydrogen, but really for appliances, the goal is to have no change, which is what we've demonstrated up to 20%. Beyond that, you need to start to get into changing burners uh, and other uh, safety control aspects of a domestic appliance, for instance. And at that point, the question is, why would you do that and not go all the way to 100% and get to, to the end state? So that's why we kind of have two stages moving to 20% as the first enabler with minimal change or non-disruptive change to consumers. And then when you need to do a disruptive change for consumers, you go to the end state. But for industrial and commercial processes that are more complicated, you can also get some minor control modifications and capacity limits potentially, but it, it's a case by case basis, depending on how close to the limit you have pushed your system already. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll stop here uh, uh, the question and answer session due to paucity of time. Thank you all the panelists uh, for the Q&A sessions. Uh, now, may I invite Mr. DLN Sasri, Director, Oil Refining and Marketing, FIPI, to give a vote of thanks and concluding remarks. Thank you, Sujoy. First, I would like to excuse myself for, because the video, there is some issue. Okay. Uh, on behalf of uh, Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry, I would like to sincerely thank all of all the participants for, uh, despite the odd hours, uh, for finding it convenient to join in huge number. There are about 111 participants we could reach. And uh, my sincere uh, thanks to all the three speakers, Mr. Charles, Mr. Ivan, and Mr. Singhal for sparing their time from their busy schedule and sharing their uh, thoughts and experience. Hydrogen has taken a center stage in the worldwide debate about the energy transition and existing gas pipelines and infrastructure. Hopefully, if we can uh, repurpose them for transport and storage of hydrogen as part of our global energy transition, uh, that will be a great thing. So we would be looking forward to more of such knowledge sharing sessions and collaborative approach with industries research organizations across the globe so that everyone uh, need not have to reinvent the wheel and the experience is shared, failures are shared so that we can gain from that and then move ahead. With these concluding words, I would like to thank everyone once again and I wish you a great happy weekend ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for joining us today and have a nice weekend.